Hello, Matt Oswald here once again with another demo for all of you uh, listeners and watchers. Uh, I am going to be demonstrating a, uh, a suite of tools, um, some of which I've already blogged and, and screencasted before, uh, but I'm using them in a way that's kind of interesting. Uh, today we're going to be looking at automating the configuration of a DHCP server using, uh, first of all, Git. So we're using Git to version control our configuration artifacts. Uh, we are storing that Git repository within a piece of software called Garrett. Garrett is a very commonly used uh, version control software, particularly in the open source world. I know that uh, OpenStack and Open Daylight both use them, uh, it as well as, um, I'm sure, a myriad of other projects. Um, and then uh, also Jenkins, which is which is kind of the same. It's basically uh, it's basically used by quite a few open source communities and and internally to a few uh, organizations that do software development. Um, and Jenkins is, uh, I guess you'd call it a, a build server. I don't know what the official title is. I've, I've used it for, for quite a few different things. It's very commonly used to like build a repository, like, you know, like a Java project. It would run like Maven, for instance. And uh, it basically ensures that your code is, is constantly uh, compiling correctly. Uh, and that way, if there's an error, everybody knows about it. You can do things like email alerts. We're going to be using it for a slightly different purpose, uh, as you'll see, uh, and that is to kick off Ansible jobs. And Ansible is actually what we're going to use to push down the configuration to our DHCP server. All of these tools using uh, used in tandem to create a sort of CI pipeline for um, what ultimately is kind of a simple example, but my goal is to really show you uh, this simple example so that it's obvious, you know, what, what exactly we're doing. Um, I, as, um, as well as I'm sure you can imagine, the, uh, the various different things uh, that we can do with such a workflow. But the first thing we're going to do is just get some situational awareness. I'm in, a, I'm in the Git repository that I've created on my local PC here. Now, this Git repository actually hosts um, our Ansible uh, role. And if you don't know what Ansible roles are, I encourage you to check them out. Uh, long and short of it is, it's basically the configuration of how we want Ansible to work um, and, uh, and, and how we want Ansible to push our configuration down. So all of the various uh, specific files uh, and templates used to push... Uh, you know, to, to well to drive a configuration in uh, the DHCP server we're using, which by the way is ISC DHCP server uh, in Linux. Uh, all of that is contained within this roles file. Um, so what we're going to do is just do like a quick um, roles, uh, and then we can do actually DHCP. It's actually nested quite deeply. So yeah, this is the typical uh, typical layout for for directories, and I'm sorry for the color. I need to change that, but. Uh, um, Handlers, tasks, templates, and bars. This is the layout. We're going to look at a few of these things. This is not a primer on Ansible roles, but um, the vars that we're going to be using uh, are in here, and then there's a template for uh, the DHCP configuration file that's in here. So first off, let's take a look at... Um, uh, actually, let's go over a tab. I want to show you the current running configuration um, on the DHCP server. So this is after everything, this is the running configuration, the configuration file that is on our DHCP server. As you can see, we've got a few reservations, um, you know, MAC address and IP address mappings there for, for reserving those MAC addresses, uh, or reserving those IP addresses for those devices, and then all of the other options for the scope. Um, this is the end result template, or the end result configuration file. Now, that configuration file is stored in our Ansible role, going back to my laptop now, uh, if we go to CD uh, roles, DHCP templates, I believe it's in. Yes, that would make sense. You'll see that we have a single file, and we and I kind of got lazy and just copied the whole thing, but I did make a certain portion of it templatized, and this is using the Jinja2 language. Um, so what it's going to do basically is it's going to loop through a variable called reservations, and we're going to show you where that's pulled from, uh, and it's going to create one of those host entries for every single one. And it's going to give it the host name. It's going to give it the MAC address and the IP address uh, according. And of course, this totally depends on how that data is being stored. So let's take a look at that. Um, go up a few. I think it's in vars. Yes, that would make sense. Yes. Uh, so we do see vars.yaml. This is a YAML file that outlines all of our DHCP reservations. Now, if you remember up here, the way that our Jinja2 template was created, we did a host name uh, info, there's a key value pair, um, but we're pulling it from reservations. And reservations, as you can see in the YAML file, sorry about that, had a phone call. Uh, where was I? Uh, so uh, reservations is just a dictionary um, laid out in our YAML file. So what we're doing in our template is just looping through that and saying for every key value pair, which is 
here and here. Um, or for rather, sorry, for here, this is the key, and then this whole block would be considered the value. Um, get info.mac address, which is this info.ip address, get this. So really it's just a big loop. It's looping through all of these instances and, pu and putting it into the template. This is like templating 101 if you've looked at Jinja 2 uh, before. Powerful stuff, but also very, very simple to do. Now, let's take a simple use case, and let's just say, you know what, we, we, we have a fifth server that we want to bring online. Um, let's add a reservation to it. Again, a very simple example. Uh, so let's do dhcpvars.yaml. Serve v05. One one two two oh five, and we're adding the IP address here. Save that, and now, as you can see, Git has picked up our change, so we need to commit that. Let's add it to the to the uh, let's stage that file, and we'll do a Git uh, commit. We're going to sign off on this, and this is. Um, a uh, key thing that I'll show you here in a second why we do that. Um, signing off on a commit is actually, uh, from a Git perspective, it's optional. Um, but for when you're using Garrett, it's actually required. Uh, what did it say? Added SRV05. <clears throat> and there you go. Now, um, if you look at the commits that I've made in the past, I made a few uh, test ones, and thus the very funny uh, commit messages. But um, essentially, when you sign off like that, you you allow uh, the Garrett hooks that I've installed into this repo to uh, assign a change ID. Now, for the longest time, I thought that this was the same as the git commit ID, but it is not. As you can see, they are different. This is the change ID that's used in Garrett. And the reason for that is you can put multiple commits into a single Garrett change ID, which is very interesting. Um, so this is essentially, from, from Git's perspective, this is just a comment. A comment. Uh, but Garrett picks this up and says, oh, you want to be in this change ID. Okay, I'll put you there. Uh, so we've committed. Now we need to push. Uh, and I believe I have, I'll just type it out, git push uh, SSH. Always use SSH whenever possible. Um, and of course, this assumes you've set up all the authentication ahead of time, um, which I have. And it's on port 29418 by default. Ansible dhp.git. And we're going to say head refs for master. There we go. Okay, so um, what I've done, uh, let me just take a, a quick step back and show you everything that I've done up to this point. I've added uh, SRV05. So if we do a git status, that commit um, is, uh, is is committed and it's pushed. Everything is up to date. Uh, and the Garrett server now, if we go over to Safari for this, sorry, I kind of had my previous exercise there. Uh, our current changes are now in a change ID here. They've been pushed up. Now, the, now the great thing about Garrett, and um, I'm sure you could probably do this with other Git servers, but uh, Garrett excels at this, um, which is probably why it's so useful in the open source community, you can actually use this for code review. That's really its main purpose, is reviewing uh, code changes. Um, so the changes that I've made actually are not in the Git repository. If I were to do, if I were to go onto, onto uh, uh, you know, another um, PC and clone this repository, the changes that I just made, adding SRV05, actually would not be pulled down. They actually haven't been pushed into the repository yet. Um, what's required here is for me as the reviewer um, or conceivably somebody else, uh, I now need to approve this. Um, so just like I would review code, I would say, you know, click uh, side by side for, for this file. I would say, oh, okay, cool. You know, you've added uh, SRV05. It looks like you've got the right MAC address in there. Oops, sorry. Uh, it looks like you've got the right MAC address in there, IP address. So this, this looks good to me. Uh, let me go back and click review and click approve. Hello, Matt. This looks good. Publish and submit, and now when I push this button, I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna wait a second while I explain this. When I push this button, Jenkins will automatically pick this up, and uh, as you can see, I have a job Ansible DHCP, which watches the Git repository for changes. Um, so it's configured uh, to look at this Git repository, uh, authenticate into it, and so on and so forth. Um, 
and it's triggered when a change is merged. Now, I could have said, there's quite a few things you can put in here. Uh, for instance, there's different uh, Garrett statuses, like for instance, uh, patch set created. Like if I, if I wanted to trigger this immediately when somebody makes a push, then you'd do that. But I actually only want to trigger this after the change has been merged, which implies that somebody has approved it, which is why this Jenkins job has not been yet kicked off. So this is an optimal configuration for um, you know, doing things in an automated fashion in production, but with a little bit of, uh, let, shall we say, sanity checking. Um, but essentially, it's, it's waiting for this change to merge. Once that happens, it's going to pull down that, that, that copy locally to this Ansible server, and it's going to run this uh, set of commands, basically, to run the Ansible playbook. Uh, and this Ansible playbook contains, um, it's, it's, it's referring to the uh, playbook and the role found in that Git repository. So it's just running what's, what's been pulled down. Pretty, pretty useful. In fact, there's, a, there's a quite a few other things you can do. Um, you, just a real quick look, I actually have uh, configured this uh, to tweet. <laughs> when, uh, when, when something happens, uh, there's another job that, that does that. I have a Twitter account for that. Um, you can obviously imagine email notifications being super useful, uh, especially if something breaks. Our aim, though, for now, is to get this to run successfully without breaking. Uh, and let's leave page. Let's go back. Uh, I want to watch this. Um, Jenkins, whenever whenever a build runs, it'll pop up here. So when we go back to Garrett and approve this new change, it will show uh, number 14 in progress, and then hopefully it will succeed. Uh, so we're going to publish and submit. It's now part of the code base. Jenkins should pick it up fairly quickly. There we go. A lot of gobbledygook, but it'll eventually go away. And there we go. Now we can click on this particular job and look at console output to actually see what Ansible ran. And as you can see, it detected that the uh, DHCP configuration file has changed because our YAML file has changed. So obviously the template would have rendered something differently from what it rendered last. Um, and it's letting us know that that change has been uh, put into place. Now, that's all cool. Let's just look at terminal again to make sure that we've seen this. I haven't changed anything on the server itself. I'm just going to push up to look at the new changes. And as you can see, it's put into the configuration file flawlessly. So that's great. Uh, let's look at something else. I want to real briefly uh, look at the uh, template. Now, if I do something uh, to break this, like if I'm if I'm a you know an, an administrator and I'm fat finger something, let's say I mistype subnet and it says subit, which is not a word, uh, and I'll do wq to save and then I'll do a git add, git commit with a message of test fat finger. All right, another push. What that's going to do is create a new job within Garrett. So I'll go to changes, test fat finger. I will oops, not abandon. I will review and approve this change. And we will go back to Jenkins. As you can see, it's already triggered for job 15. And what's going to happen uh, is that the originating DHCP server, or the, I guess the destination DHCP server, will fail to start because we had a typo in the configuration file. Well, Ansible knows that. Ansible will actually report that. As you can see, it says job failed to start, failed to start the service um, after changing the configuration file to be the new fat fingered version, uh, which is passed back up into Jenkins. Now, since Jenkins recognizes that this, uh, I'm putting doing air quotes, this build has failed, it's going to treat it just like any other, just like any other, uh, you know, software package. And in in that scenario, you'd want to send off an email uh, or a Slack uh, notification or 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 or, or something um, to notify whoever is in charge of this repository that that the build is breaking. Somebody made a change that is breaking this. Um, in which case, you can go back to your approval process and say, hey, you guys let this error through. You need to be more careful about that next time. They go in, they fix the build, everything's happy. Uh, but that's an example of using a software development practice to uh, very carefully uh, push changes into production um, so that you get that speed of deployment, you get that uh, consistent 
you know, that automated uh, consistency that, uh, that really is one of the biggest values of automation, but in a way that's safe and in a way that's trackable. Um, so I hope this was useful. It's just an example. There's so many different things that you can do with this, but I wanted it to be quick and short. Um, do let me know if you have any ideas for this, and I'd be happy to put up a video. Thanks for watching.